What is a contradiction? It's when two things are opposing or have diametrically opposed goals or aspirations or effects that cancel each other out or two types of truths that seem to exist in the same space. In the Marxist sense, it is the opposition of social and political forces where the relationship between worker and employer or laborer and capitalist is exploitative. The worker toils at an hourly or daily rate lesser than the profits that their labor generates for the capitalist who rents their body. The capitalist exploits the needs of the worker. The worker needs a home, needs a job, needs money in order to survive. And at its base, the relationship is defined by this imbalance of power. The capitalist does not have the same material needs as the worker. They have started the game with a better hand. They are then able to account for risk taking. They can employ somebody for a fraction of what their labor value is truly worth to that worker's time and sacrifice, all to make more profits for themselves. That the worker must work with tools they do not own in a workplace that they do not own for the benefit of another at the expense of one's own profits at the behest of their master. Wage slavery, as it says in the name, is a type of slave labor where one works for a wage that is barely passable in terms of livability. It's better than actual slavery, but not by much. The contradictory nature of capitalism is deeply set within the economic forces that compose its larger institutions and relationships. The worker is exploited for their body, their energy, and most importantly, their time. They exchange this time and energy and the very constitution of their body to receive a fraction of the profits generated by their labor. Capitalist shills will tell you that this relationship is fair, and if you want to have nice things, then you got to put in the hard work, the grind, and so on. Marx writes in Wage, Labor, and Capital, 1847, and this life activity, the worker, sells to another person in order to secure the necessary means of life. He works that he may keep alive. He does not count the labor itself as a part of his life. It is rather a sacrifice of his life. It is a commodity that he has auctioned off to another. The distribution of the fruits of labor are unequal in capitalist society. In 2022, the average CEO in the United States was paid 344 times more than the average production and non-supervisory worker in the company's key industry. This is known as the CEO to worker compensation ratio, and this ratio has increased over time. If you do not know what the S&P 500 is, it is essentially a tracker for the performance of 500 of the largest companies listed on the stock exchanges in the United States. It is one of the most commonly followed indices and includes approximately 80% of total market capitalization or money of US public companies with an aggregate market cap of more than $43 trillion as of January, 2024. The average CEO at an S&P 500 company made $16.7 million, median CEO profits being 16.3 million. Notice I said median, at the second time around, which is more accurately reflective of the majority as it is not skewed by outlier values at the higher or lower ends of the curve. While median weekly earnings of full-time workers were around $1,143, women making 81.2% of men at $1,017, while men made $1,253. The median annual wage of all U.S. workers in 2023 was $48,060. I will leave links in the description for you to read more on these stats to see where I get them from. My point is, CEOs unfairly pay themselves for not doing a damn thing. They steal the benefits of the labor of their workers right from under them. They are parasites. Every CEO that exists, every millionaire, every billionaire, are parasites who cannot exist without extracting labor from workers and the consumers alike. Karl Marx writes in Capital, Volume 1, Chapter 10, 1867, 
As capitalist, he is only capital personified. His soul is the soul of capital. But capital has one single life impulse, the tendency to create value and surplus value, to make its constant factor, the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus labor. Capital is dead labor that, vampire-like, only lives by sucking living labor and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. This insane inequality creates the material conditions necessary for poverty. Without billionaires, there can be no poverty, as it is a direct result of the actions of capitalists owning private land, inheriting wealth, and reinvesting it into the system that furthers the cycle of abuse and exploitation. The abuses of the state and the capitalists are exploiting the state in which workers are put into under the material conditions of a market capitalist economy that they are living in perpetual crisis. The exploitation of human labor is rooted in the concept that capitalism requires crisis to remain running. The worker is left at a state of crisis at the end of every pay period. They have to stretch these last couple dollars before the next check comes in. This is in effect keeping the worker constantly at their wits end, trying to make ends meet, with no possible hope for changing the system. Before we can have collective political social action, we have to pay our rent first. This shows the constant crisis state that capitalism requires to continue running. The worker never has quite enough to survive. They never have quite enough to be self-sufficient. So they are continually hooked, maintained, abused, and coerced by the system. As their labor value is put into the system, so does the system extract from the labor his human life, blood, and time, etc. More than he puts into it originally. The resources mined from particular locations causes environmental damage and degradation, harming the people who live on the land base, which causes numerous crises. Imperialist colonialism is the backbone of capitalism. Without war, proper extraction of labor, resources, commodities, human life from colonies in the early modern period, there would be no proper development of the transatlantic slave trade the building of capital and land ownership in stolen land bases from the natives originally living in the Americas, and the eventual creation of the internal combustion engine and industrialization as we have seen. The negative consequences of industrialization are numerous, and will get the time and attention that topic deserves in another essay. But you can see how these topics are interlocking, and that there never truly is a single issue that exists within a vacuum. Homelessness is tied to the economic system which is tied to the geopolitics of the nation as a whole. War is profitable, and so is colonialism, and so these processes of destruction upon the innocents bring great boons to those in the global north. And now we get to the crux of this essay. Homelessness as a phenomenon is created by society. It is a social construction. What does that mean? That means that it is a product of the reification of social relations that we believe it to be so, and so it is. Be in the ontological sense that it exists because we have social relations that reinforce the common understanding of such things. And so our physical world reflects the nature of social concepts and ideas and beliefs. We create our own social problems through the contradictions of society. These contradictions are extensive and stem from capitalism's exploitation of all the natural world. This includes human beings. Karl Marx writes in his critique of Hegel's philosophy in general, 1844, man is directly a natural being. As a natural being and as a living natural being, he is on the one hand endowed with natural powers, vital powers. He is an active natural being. These forces exist in him as tendencies and abilities, as instincts. On the other hand, as a natural, corporeal, sensuous, objective being, he is a suffering, conditioned, and limited creature, like animals and plants. A being which does not have its nature outside itself is not a natural being, and plays no part in the system of nature. A being which has no object outside itself is not an objective being. What is a home? A constructed space a shelter, to protect from the elements in danger. It's a place to live and thrive and eat and work and sleep and laugh and cry. But what is a home in terms of economics? A home is nothing but property. It has value, 
and can be bought and sold and leased and destroyed. But capital is chiefly involved in the modern concept of what we call a home. And what is private property? In the capitalist sense, private property is land owned by a single individual or company to which they have free reign to do whatever they wish upon this land. They can destroy a river, deforest an entire landscape, frack and drill for oil. They own the land and now they can extract resources from it. This is a form of violence in the anarchist sense. Now what do I mean by that? Private property is violence. T. Collins Logan writes in Private Property as Violence, why proprietarian systems are incompatible with the non-aggression principle. Private property commits violence upon the individual through exclusion and deprivation as forms of deliberate aggression. Private ownership of land causes what were once public, freely accessible resources to the community to become commodified, where now there is artificial scarcity of resources. Nestle is a prime example of this inaction, where private property control and acquisition is a direct form of violence upon the surrounding community where the activities lie. Marx writes in Human Requirements and Division of Labor in 1844, under private property, each tries to establish over the other an alien power, so as thereby to find satisfaction in his own selfish need. The increase in the quantity of objects is therefore accompanied by an extension of the realm of the alien powers to which man is subjected, and every new product represents a new potentiality of mutual swindling and mutual plundering. It is understood that private property becomes a vector of disease in a sense, and that the disease is corruption of the human being into a swindler by default. Food being thrown out at the end of the night at every restaurant or grocery store is a contradiction in capitalism's means of distribution. Rather than being given to the homeless and starving, they have to go digging in the dumpster to get a chance at that perfectly good food that was thrown out because it's not profitable to simply give away that excess product. Imagine if businesses were required to donate any food products that would surely go to waste if they aren't sold at the end of the workday. Any food that is about to expire or near to expiration are instead distributed to aid those starving and dying of hunger or malnutrition. But that would only be a band-aid on the great wound that is capitalism. The system itself must be destroyed in favor of cooperative measures. In order to survive, one must go to work at a job for an employer. They must do the monkey dance required of them for the day, and so they can get their participation check in the mail two weeks in the future. In the meantime, one must continually reify this abusive and humiliating relationship with their employer on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. They are dehumanized, reduced to a mere tool of the master's production, and their human potential goes unseen. This dehumanization is by design. It is crafted alienation by the relations that labor has to capital and the homeless are the most alienated of all within society. Homeless people are even worse off than the wage slave because they have already fallen through the cracks. They must somehow now prove that they are even human beings, even hireable, and generally most workplaces require you to have some form of mailing address. You must be cataloged, inventoried, with your precise location exacted by the powers that be for the employer to rent your body for profit can't have a mailing address if you don't have a home, and so this is one of many barriers. This is when we come to realize that homelessness is not a bug, but a feature of capitalism. It would not work otherwise. The system requires a constant source of surplus labor to draw from. People who are not currently working, but can and are in constant need of work. As in a capitalist nation, it is paramount to hoard resources, to create artificial scarcity of resources. Homes, which were once understood essentially for shelter, become one of these commodities that are hoarded by the wealthy. In the city of Jacksonville, Florida, where I am from, rental prices and the cost of living are skyrocketing. And this is in no small part due to more than a quarter of rentals owned by institutional investors, that is, housing owned by private businesses, are in the hands of one single company. Progress Residential, which owns more than 2,700 homes in 2023. Next is AMH, formerly known as American Homes for Rent, with more than 1,400 homes. According to a January 2024 point in time count by the nonprofit Changing Homelessness, 567 people were experiencing unsheltered homelessness 
in Jacksonville in 2024, up 43% in 2023. And an even larger figure at 851 people were experiencing sheltered homelessness, meaning they are living with friends or in temporary shelters. Don Gilman, CEO of Changing Homelessness, called the increase very concerning and one of the largest the organization has seen in recent years. Jacksonville is also preparing for a new state law that takes effect in October 2024 that bans people from sleeping outside, which is going to lead to an even larger increase in mass incarceration. The city is apparently working on a plan to address where the homeless population will go. This is class warfare in the truest sense. Instead of giving people homes, working on social programs that benefit those who are homeless, and effectively addressing the claws of poverty, politicians and lawmakers are more concerned with simply sweeping the homeless population out of the city or folding them into the prison system. The bourgeois are one step away from simply sending the SS to mow down homeless in the streets indiscriminately. Florida's incarceration rate is 795 people per 100,000, which is the 13th highest in the United States. This rate is more than 20% higher than the national average. The incarceration rate of the United States is larger than any other country in the world. The 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution abolished slavery and involuntary servitude with the exception of punishment for crime. This is known as the Penal Exception Clause and has led to the exploitation of incarcerated people and the creation of the prison industrial complex. In 2021, Florida's private prison population was 11,728, which is 14% of the entire prison population in the state. Now, the reason why I'm giving these figures is because the United States has set itself up to have legal slavery and is planning on folding the homeless population into it even further than it already currently does into this larger slave population. It is a feature, not a bug. It is a feature of American capitalism. If you do not work, you cannot pay rent. If you cannot pay rent, you are evicted and become homeless. If you are homeless, then pretty soon you will be criminalized by default. Pretty soon we are going to see a surge in prison populations, which is already the largest by a wide margin of any country on the planet. I got into an argument with someone online relatively recently about the relevance of Karl Marx and his writings. And the longer that I am alive, the more things I experience and the more my labor alienates me personally from what I wish to do most of all, which is to have a family, raise crops, play video games, learn more things and help improve the material conditions of my fellow man. The more I feel that Marx is timeless in his philosophy, his analysis of economics, his critiques of capitalism, which to most people are inherently relatable, yet they are betrayed by their dedication to the idea that they may one day become powerful like the vampiric parasites that sign our paychecks. I will leave you off with a final quote from Marx and Engels, written in Strategy and Tactics of the Class Struggle in 1879. For nearly 40 years, we have raised to prominence the idea of the class struggle as the immediate driving force of history, and particularly the class struggle between bourgeois and the proletariat as the great lever of our modern social revolution. At the founding of the International, we expressly formulate the battle cry. The emancipation of the working class must be the work of the working class itself. <laughs>